any inconvenience, and we'll try to get messages over to the group event to tell, ask you to please join us on our YouTube channel. Uh, we had difficulty joining the event live, and so rather than we want to blow some glass and show you glass incorporated with wood. So what you see on the back there, those two large pieces of wood were created by someone for us, and then we managed to blow the glass to fit in the uh, container, if you will, of glass, of wood. Then we uh, took the glass out of there, took it through the annealing process, which takes about eight to 10 hours, and then uh, carved it a little bit on the top to the sculpture or vessel, if you will. So that's one type of thing we've done. Here's another one down front, another example here with the uh, little green vase in there. What we're gonna show you today is more along these lines. We've got a couple of samples to try for you. We're gonna be incorporating the glass laid on top of is an African wood called Mopani, and it's very dense. We actually buy it from a pet store. It's used uh, for, by folks in uh, aquariums but it's really good for putting hot glass on. So while uh, Josh Reese is getting set up and ready to go, I'm gonna turn around here and introduce you to Foster Holcomb, owner of the studio. Hello, Foster. Hi, and welcome to the from the art of fire. And uh, in just a few moments, without further ado, we will get uh, underway making glass to incorporate with the Mopani wood. And we're glad that you're with us, whether you're in your evening hours, your morning hours, or your afternoon hours, such as we are on the East Coast. Thank you for being with us. Okay, great. And uh, some of you may, we're really thrilled to have been invited to the event in January. Some of you may have observed that. Since this is not a woodworking shop, I'll give you a little bit of a tour real quick of our studio area and explain to you what we're working with here and then uh, we'll get making the glass in just a moment. We melted pounds of molten glass and we melt that glass oh about once a week or so. Uh, it's a full production studio here. Foster, would you mind opening the door? Absolutely. It'll be really bright here, it'll be difficult to see but you can probably glimpse the flame in the back. Our uh, heat source is propane, so it uh, connected up to the system, and we're using propane to fuel. Next to that is a heating unit we call a pipe warmer. Our pipes have to be preheated, and uh, we do that before we gather so that the glass will stick good, well to the, the pipe. The glass adheres a little bit better when the pipe's pre-warmed to about 900 or 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And while we're at it, I'm gonna just show you a charity event going on where we're selling what we call Maryland cats. The cats are created in the colors of the Maryland state flag. We did an event back in November and December where we raised a couple thousand dollars for No Kid Hungry. And so these cats are $60 a piece, but half of that goes to charity. So, since we're doing this for charity, that's what they look like, and if you're interested, you can contact the studio. Limited production, we're only going to be doing that during the month of March, so we're almost done. This unitory hole, this does not contain glass. It's a, basically a ceramic tube, and you can see that it's got a burner up in it. And that burner is where the, the flame comes out, and we heat this unit to approximately 2300 degrees. Uh, when the glass comes out of our furnace, it's about 2,000 degrees. Once it begins, reheat it, and that's why we have the glory hole. So if we lost the live feed there for just a moment, look here, this is the interior of the glory hole, the reheating unit. As we move on over here, you can see one that's lit. This is the one that Josh Reese will be using today to reheat the glass bring it back up in temperature 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. He'll have to reheat it. The excess heat in here will actually warm it a lot more and bring it back up. So, uh, let's see. Here's our wood that we're using today. 
Which one will you use first, Josh? Let's go ahead and use this guy first. Okay. So I'll get a little sizing up of what we'll have it size up. Okay. So Josh is going to gather some clear glass from our furnace and then once he's got an adequate amount of clear glass gathered, he will collect what we call frit or granular glass on the outside of it. And also he'll be using baking soda in this piece, which is really interesting because what that will do is cause bubbles to appear iron, the end of the iron with the hot glass on it into the blue colored frit and that will give him the color concentration he needs. Now he's using a wooden cup. We call it a block. It's made of cherry wood. We use a fruit wood because of the tight grain. They're kept in water. They're actually cut green. We don't want them to dry out. We don't want them to crack and we don't want them to lose shape. He's now blown into the pipe. He covered the end of it with his finger and that compressed air had nowhere to go but out into the glass bubble. So, over here we have a pipe cooler, a simple trough with a small pump that generates a little bit of stream of water and allows us to cool the pipe. The pipes don't get excessively hot, but every once in a while they'll get a little bit warm. And right now it looks like he's going to drop a little bit of the baking soda on here. So he's putting the baking soda, sprinkling it on, it's very important right now to go for the next step at just the right temperature because he's going to want to gather over this when the temperature on this is good. If he does this too quickly and it's all too hot, the bubbles will get excessively large. He's covering that over now with more clear glass and as soon as he comes out we should be able to see bubbles forming from the baking soda on the surface of the glass. They're a random pattern. We really have no control over this. Some are larger, some are smaller. So, welcome aboard. Thanks for those of you that have gone through the effort to find us. Apologize for the confusion earlier, but we had difficulty linking to the event to start the YouTube video. But we actually do YouTube videos every week. If you happen to be interested, on Tuesday mornings at uh, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the U.S., we do a, a video broadcast of about 30 minutes showing different glass blowing techniques. He's picking up more of the baking soda and he's changing the location of it a little bit. So, um, anyway, we do the YouTube videos on Tuesday, 10.30 Eastern Daylight Time and we'll be doing the Facebook Live presentation, which is a full two hours, and we get into a lot more detail in case you're interested in learning more about glass blowing. You'll notice that the band that he's putting on right now of the baking soda is not covering the entire level of glass. That's gonna give him two zones on here. One will have a lot more coverage of baking soda, hence when he gathers, it will have a lot more bubbles in it. The area that he's not covering will not bubble up so much. Well, I actually have a baking soda and then the white. So we're actually gonna this get your the white, white powder? Okay. The white. So we're going to get that white to bubble up. From the the white's going to bubble at the top of the vessel. So yes. here we go. And actually, you can see it taking place right there now. So you'll be making what? Three of these cups? Yeah. Okay. So he's going to make three of these cups and then after they are formed, he's going to heat the bottoms of them with a torch and then place them onto the wood. So this is actually the white powder here he was rolling through. That's what's going to give him a bubble effect up to the top of the vessel. When we make our pieces, we work on the bottom half to two thirds first, then take it off of the blowing iron put it onto another iron and finish the piece. He's checking the calipers to see about the size of this. So what you're looking at right now, outboard from the pipe, is the lower end of the piece. The actual opening or lip of the vessel will be up toward the top, which is next to the blowpipe. 
On that last trip to the bench, he was using a pair of metal blades called jacks to create a mark or a line, a point of separation from the blowpipe. Sometimes we just blow directly into the pipe instead of a lot of pressure on here. The jack blades now are creating this jack line or neckline, which will form a really convenient place to separate this piece from the blowpipe. The pipe, please, monster. straightening the side of this a little bit, using the jacks kind of as a straight edge and giving himself a little bit of gentle curvature. And the next step you'll see is what we call a transfer. Foster's taking an iron with a little bit of glass on it and he's shaping it up so only a small amount extends off the end of the pipe. It acts kind of like a glue bit, if you will. He'll bring that pipe over to Josh, who will place it in the center of the bottom. And then after he's got it placed and attached, he will deliberately break the glass free at the constriction he made with the jacks. Right now with the turning and pressing with the tweezers, he's got it centered. Water weakens the joint and then a tap and it breaks free. Foster will take it to the glory hole to begin reheating. That joint was cold enough to fracture. It's going to take just a little while to reheat to the point that it's malleable again and he'll be able to manipulate it into the shape he wants. It's going to roughly look like a drinking vessel. Actually, it will kind of look, it will look very much like a drinking vessel when he first does this, but after he jams it onto the piece of wood, the shape will get distorted a little bit at the bottom because it's going to fit right in the wood. Hello, Rude. Good to have you here with us. Uh, we're doing a demonstration where we incorporate glass into the woodworking. So, now Josh will use his jacks to reach into that small opening and begin to enlarge the opening of the vessel. So right now it's kind of looking like a stemless wine glass, which is really pretty close to what that is. By using the jacks and keeping the iron turning, he can regain the symmetry on that. And then once he's happy with that, he'll actually break it off onto this uh, piece of fiberboard over here to the right of the marver. The marver is a metal table we use to roll the glass. It's going to get noisy now. Foster's heated the bottom to where it will move. Josh is going to place it onto the wood at the location he wants this. And with his gloved hands, he presses the glass down in place. It assumes the shape of the wood. And as soon as he's happy that it'll fit there and we'll be able to place it in that spot later on, he'll take it and it'll go into an annealer. Here's the impression on the bottom the Mopani wood. We'll spray the end of this wood where it's still smoking a little bit with a little bit of water. Cool it down some, but this stuff is really uh, pretty close to steel in some respects. So that's our process, okay? So what we've got there is the piece of the Mopani wood, and then we create the cups, which will go in it. And Josh will be doing a total of three. So you can see that the first one went here where it's still smoking. He's going to have one, I believe, in the middle and one down toward the lower end. A variety of sizes, Josh? Yeah, just kind of fit in. Uh -huh. A nice one to kind of fit in there. Maybe a medium-sized one to go there. So. Okay, cool. Very good. Yeah. So are all the cups going to be of pretty much the same color? 
No, I think we're going to change it up a little bit. Um, not thinking about the process, I don't know if you noticed, the white actually silvered a little bit. And that's not ideal. What happened was, maybe Bruce can explain it a little bit, but the white reduced. And we really don't want that reduction in the finished piece. So we might change it up a little bit. Okay. So when he refers to reduction, that's a chemical process that takes place within the colors. The propane torch that you saw Foster using is really just burning propane. This is not an, a fully oxygen starved flame, but it has a lower oxygen content than the flames that we normally use. So when a flame that is oxygen starved comes into contact with certain metal oxides, and some of our glasses are made with these, it will actually pull the oxygen up, and that's what will give it a silvery or shiny surface. So Josh has mentioned that what he'd like to do is not have so much of that, so he's going to change the colors up a little bit. So while they're preparing the workspace and getting everything done there, I'll give you a little more information about some of the equipment we have on hand. This is a uh, a simple propane torch. I'm sure many of you have seen that. Um, over next to it though, we have an interesting appliance. We call this a garage. And it looks kind of like a two-car garage. And we use that for parking pieces. If we make a piece that has multiple elements and they're going to be assembled later on, quite often we'll put them in here to keep them warm while we construct the rest of the vessel. This comes in particularly handy in making goblets. Alright, let's do a big one for this one. I think people would enjoy seeing that one. Okay. So we've got a different piece of wood here, and this is going to be a larger cup than Josh, a larger yep, vessel. I think we're gonna do. We'll just fill it out really nicely. Oh, okay. Alright. Going big. Alrighty. Hey, Foster. Yes, sir. Number one is off, isn't it? Yes. Okay, or been off. All right, so while they're doing that, I'm going to show you inside of an annealer. An annealer, for us anyway, is basically just a big box of bricks. It has a flame that's generated. I'll turn around here so we can... It comes up through that chimney in the back. The heat does, and it circulates through this. Here's our burner with our air and propane supplies right here. And with this box of bricks, we can put the glass away and it'll maintain temperature. One of the things about a piece of glass that we've made is it has to anneal properly or it will shatter. The internal stresses in the glass will tear it apart. So, let's get back over here and I'll tell you a little more about annealers in a minute. Okay, so Josh has Another gather, a little larger this time. Again, blocking it with the cherry wood mold. The cherry wood, uh, having such a tight grain and soaked in water all the time, creates a really nice bed of steam. You can see that rising from the glass. It acts almost like a lubricant to let the glass slide easily across the cup. If that was completely dry, we'd get burning and sticking and have a really bad mess on our hands. Josh now will blow into the pipe, cover the opening with his finger, and the air has no place to go but out into the glass. And you can see that bubble form right away. Quite often people ask us, uh, don't the pipes get hot? And you saw Josh use the pipe cooler earlier. Usually if we feel a pipe getting warm, it's because there was a uh, residual moisture inside which heated up. Just from the gathering and reheating process, this iron or pipe only gets hot for about oh, 12 to 14 inches above the point where the glass is. The rest of it's a stainless steel that does not conduct heat all that well. So we get used to working with that. Sometimes if there's a little moisture, inside the pipe, that will boil off and make the pipe a little hot to our touch. Josh is taking another gather again. Glass blowers use multiple gathers based on the size of the vessel they choose to make. 
So he's increased the volume here. He's got a lot more glass on the end of the blowing iron. And he's going to cool that pipe off a little bit before he continues. What is this, a cobalt blue? Oh, violet, okay. We've got a violet color here, the frit. He's going to pick that up. And one coating or two? We'll do two coatings. Okay. Get blown out a good bit. Now these are grains of glass. We purchase it from a supplier. And these grains are a little bit larger than the powder you might have seen him use earlier with the white. And what will happen is, as he blows this out, the piece will stretch. And those little shards of glass will move apart. So in order to get more continuous color coverage, he wants to make sure that he's got plenty when he starts so that he moves along through the piece he doesn't wind up with bare spots. It looks almost completely coated in color and all of the colors will look kind of a bright orange from the glow of the metal oxides due to the heat. But as it cools in that wooden block you can see the color change dramatically. It darkens. Now he'll blow again, cap the pipe with his finger, and you'll see the diameter increase. Now, when we get color on the outside, quite often, especially if it's opaque, it can be very difficult to see in and tell what's going on. Right now he's using folded newspaper. This is about seven sheets of standard newsprint, folded tight, and then wet. It makes a perfect insulator and protects your hand. Right now, he's reaching for what we call a diamond optic mold. We'll get down here so you can take a look inside of it. Kind of like looking into a shark's mouth with rows of teeth. Those diamond points will catch the glass as he blows real hard and put impressions into the glass. He'll actually have to suck in on the pipe very gently and twist it to get it out of the mold. There he goes in, and now watch what he does up here. He draws in, wiggles the pipe, and it comes out with those optic impressions. So that is our diamond point dip mold. Now he can blow that out and increase the diameter a little bit. The reason for having to suck in on the glass and also to wiggle it is that it could get stuck on those diamond points and not come out of the mold. And we've had experience with that, believe me. And usually no, it takes, yeah, that. yeah. I've seen you spend 45 <laughs> minutes. Because we can't just take a, an awl and start poking at the, uh, the mold because we'll break the little points in there. So we have to very gently get the glass that's stuck in there. So like with so many other crafts, the best thing is to do it right the first time. <laughs> and, and then we have another saying around here, it's not what you can make, it's what you can fix. So where are some of our viewers from? Uh, I haven't gotten much feedback on location. I know that a lot of them are part of the virtual craft festival. They're saying hello to each other, and they finally made it over here to join us. Okay. Well, why don't you all uh, check in and let us know uh, where you're from? Because uh, last time we did this, I remember we had a couple of folks from Scotland, Northern Ireland, from Brian at Hartwood Turning. Great. Ronnie at Norway. All right. Or Ronnie. Okay. Wonderful. Glad to have you all with us. Southwest England, Wales, Cornwall, West Sussex, West Sussex. Oh my gosh, Guam. Guam is back with us. Ontario. Holy, this thing is like blowing up, guys. Wow, that's amazing. This is so cool. France, all right, thank you. I think what we're going to do, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we do our own YouTube videos and FaceTime. We've got people from all over the world. I think we need a world camera. So Josh is gathered, uh, not a camera, a map, but Josh is gathered over the optic impressions and now where each of those indentations was 
He has created a bubble. And yes, we're happy to have you from Allentown, PA. <laughs> yep, right. Collier, uh, Washington, Southeast England. Oh man, that Forestville, Maryland. Yeah, David Hogan, hello. Okay, <laughs> no, it's great. And we love having you with us. So Josh used the slight indentations that were in that piece after he blew in the optic mold to gather over and trap air in each of those locations. And that, those, that is those fine bubbles you see in there. Oh, this is great. We have, we have got people from all over the world here. I recognize the one from Guam from last time. I think that's uh, the first time we've gone to that part of the world. Okay, he's using the newspaper to shape it now. Vasilia, California, great. All right. Now, since the color was on the surface when I went into the optic mold, the neat thing, thing about the diamond mold is that it causes the color to actually go around those, those uh, bubbles. So that's how it's going to go out. You kind of start to see the pattern a little bit. Sure, Elkton, Maryland. Yes, Brian Ritter. Barry's in the shed from Essex, England. Glad to have you with us. So the pattern Josh is talking about is where the bubbles appear to be pushing the color glass around. And there'll be like a clear dot right in the middle of a uh, di uh, diamond-shaped blue pattern. Yep. And how could we forget Rude in the Netherlands? No, we would not forget that at all. Rude's been with us uh, videos for quite a while. It's good to see all of you. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you're joining us late, Jim from Bel Air, Maryland. Great. Newcastle, Delaware. Yeah, I recognize Christine. Broad Stairs, England. Malcolm Page. Thank you all. Thank hey, if you've got questions about what's going on, just ask. What's up? Is that pretty late? No, I think it's like probably 8 p.m. Okay. or uh, 20, uh, approaching 2100 for them. It's not too bad. I know that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if Netherlands is in another time zone from, uh, say, London, but I know uh, Greenwich Mean Time's four hours ahead of us right now. Okay, so now this vessel's starting to take shape. We're getting a lot more volume. Josh will slow the rotation just a moment. He can't do that for long because gravity's always present. Present. 2136 in France. Okay. 936. Yep. Okay. Not bad at all. And we hope it's been worth the wait. So anyway, uh, we're working on working this piece out. And again, just like with the others, he's going to do the lower half to two thirds of the vessel first. Then he will uh, turn it around and work on the top half. Most all of our pieces start out as a sphere with a jack line in it. The jack line is that constriction close to the blowing iron. That's where the piece will separate. Right now he's using the newspaper to actually push in on the glass. You'll see that it picked up a wider diameter and actually crushed in some. So Chris, it's 6.36 in Guam. Is that tomorrow morning? I don't remember the international date line. We're on the 27th of March. So have you made it to the 28th already? Squashing one side and then the other. He's changing the shape of it. He has his finger over the mouthpiece. This is so it can give it kind of an oval shape. You can see that the wood he's going to place it on is oblong. Yes, Chris is a day ahead. Nice to know. So now you can see this nice oval pattern in the glass. And that's what will press very beautifully down onto this piece of wood. Mokani wood, for those of you that are woodworkers and interested in that sort of thing, we buy it at a pet supply store. People use it in their aquariums. 
and we found that it goes quite well with glass. So now Foster is rolling an iron with a small amount of glass on it on our marver. The marver is a metal table we use to shape glass. It steals a lot of heat from the glass if you stay on too long, but it's actually quite good for shaping the glass and giving it a quick cooling. He'll bring it over and present it to Josh, who will place it in the center of the bottom. I'll tell you what, I'll just grab one more flash for me, please. So Josh is going to take another flash. Are you guys professionals or any of you do this just as a hobby? Well, Josh and Foster are full-time professional glass blowers. I'm a retired air traffic controller, but I got into it about 21 years ago. So it's become much more than a hobby for me. We're just not professional YouTube. Yeah, we're just not professional YouTube, as you can tell <laughs> from the fact that it took us forever to get connected. But we're here and we're doing it, and we hope that you're enjoying it. Josh is waiting for that to stabilize. A little water weakens that neck joint, that jack line. A tap of the pipe breaks it free. In case you're interested, it's generally vibration that will break your glass. So if you're moving sometime and need to pack up glass, just keep it away from vibration. Pack it well, pad it, and it shouldn't break. So uh, that little tap with the back of the tweezers was what provided enough vibration for the glass to break at the weak point. Now every once in a while we make a mistake and the neckline that we cut is the same weakness as the punty joint at the bottom. And what happens then is known as a floor model. The transfer is generally one of the breath holding moments for glass blowers. We, we're pretty confident in it, but we want to make sure that it doesn't come apart. The opening of that vessel was cold enough to fracture and it's also very tiny. So Josh is going to spend a good deal of time heating all of it to keep it above a thousand or maybe 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, but then he's going to concentrate on the upper reaches of the vessel. You can see that the opening from where it was attached to the blowing iron is very small. He's going to have to move it fast enough that you really can't see the pattern. Go ahead, Foster, if you want to get through. He's opening the vessel, and Foster's using a wooden paddle to shield his arm from the intense heat. There's a lot of heat generated by that piece of glass. And the larger it gets, it's greater proximity to Josh's forearm. We can see the bubble pattern in there. They're going to open this up a bit more. Pretty much a straight-sided vessel, Josh. Uh, curved out a little bit, flared out some. Okay. So he's going to keep opening this until he gets that opening wide enough. Then they will do the same thing as they did on the previous the vessel. The They'll knock it off of the punty onto the fiber pad that's over there on the marver and then heat it and press it in place. Now you can see that the glass begins to sag from gravity so he has to turn at a pretty consistent rate but not excessively fast or the centripetal force will cause it to open up too much. He wants to keep his oval shape and he can use the newspaper as a pad to flatten it back. Centrifugal force rounded it and opened it up. So to keep the nice profile that he wants, as the glass cools, he's able to just manipulate it gently with his jacks or the newspaper. He'll head back to the glory hole for another flash heat. The flash heat is really just a, a momentary exposure to heat. Uh, just to keep it warm, okay? We don't want it getting all uh, sloppy and melted, but we need enough heat in so it doesn't crack. Now Josh will do any final shaping to the profile here. And you can see those bubble patterns. He can use either his jacks or his newspaper to simply straighten and alter the sides. 
just going to let this cool just a little bit before he drops it onto the uh, fiber fracks, the material on the marver, and then Foster will start heating it with a torch. bottom is softened. I'll answer your question in just a moment about heat proof shield. The bottom was softened. It will press down now onto the wood. Josh will let that stabilize just a moment, take the impression of the wood on the bottom, and then when the piece is fully annealed, it'll fit perfectly. There's your bottom. And there it goes. Okay. Nicely done, Josh. Beautiful piece. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So uh, we do use heat proof shields from time to time. For the most part, the uh, large, largest number of our vessels and our work do not actually require it. Uh, Foster was doing that very much as a courtesy for Josh on that particular piece. Uh, he might have been able to do it without any shielding at all, but uh, for most of the work we do, it's not necessary. We do have them standing by, though, especially if we're doing rather large work or something uh, really involving a lot of heat. The bigger the pieces get, the larger that mass, then uh, the more we need something like the heat shielding. So. Josh is going to cool the wood down a little bit that uh, burned in a little bit, but that's kind of the nature of this wood. And coating it with a little bit of water, it'll be fine. It gives it a nice patina. Ah, there <laughs> we go. A patina. There you go. Okay, so, oh, back to the annealer since it's standing open over there. A few moments ago, I showed you it's just a box of bricks with a heat source. If Josh had taken that piece that he just created and set it on the floor, inside of perhaps 20 minutes, it would have shattered into pieces. The reason being that the internal stresses of the glass structure are such that it would rip itself apart. The exterior and the interior of the glass cool at a different rate, and because of its molecular structure, it will pull itself apart and shatter. So in order to avoid that, we spot what is called the annealing temperature of the glass. And for this particular soda lime glass, it's a, somewhere around 800 degrees. Our critical range in this glass is uh, when it cools from between about 750 and 850, or maybe even 700 to 850. Where is the wood from again? Antoinette, it's from, well actually it's from PetSmart but it's an African wood called Mopani, okay? So the deal with the annealing, since that's a pretty interesting process, is that we can put it in the annealer at a very hot temperature and it can crash to 900 with no problem. But when it starts going below nine, then we get trouble. What color have we got here? The uh, mountain blue. Mountain blue, okay. A little bit lighter than cobalt. So the annealer that we've been putting the pieces in is set right now at about 900 degrees. 
And over the course of the day, we leave all our glass in there and let it come down to a nice toasty 900 Fahrenheit. Then once the end of the day has come around, then we shut off the heat supply, the bricks retain the heat, and release the heat very slowly so that when the glass goes through its annealing range, or from about 700 to 850 degrees on its way down, from 850 down to 7, it does it at such a slow rate the stress is relieved. That's probably more information than you ever wanted to know about annealing, but we had some time to fill. Okay, so we've got another piece of wood here. You know, I like to look at the clouds and see shapes, and I'm, I'm seeing a big snail here. So what are you going to put on this snail? A bowl right in the middle? Right in the middle of his back. Okay, there you go. Okay. So this will be pretty much the same type of process. Um, there'll be a few variations as far as decorative elements probably, and we'll check in with Josh and see what he's got going on in the meantime. No, we kind of like the kind of the water theme to go with the wood. Uh huh. Kind of that driftwood kind of feel. So we'll, we'll go with the baking soda again. Okay. So it doesn't take much. All right. So this is similar to the first piece he made. He's dropping baking soda on there. And what will happen is after he goes in and takes a gather. Right now he's warming the surface just for a moment. He wants to get just the right temperature of the glass as he goes into the pool of 2,000 degree glass. He'll bring this out and it will immediately start forming bubbles where the baking soda pushes the glass. So there you can see the random bubbles in this. And again, we apologize if the incandescence of the glass prevents you from seeing it clearly. But as this cools a little bit, you'll start to see the bubbles much more clearly, especially after he takes the block to it and the temperature drops some. As he does this, the bubbles have grown in there. They're a random pattern. We really have no control over how they come out on that other than the amount of the baking soda that we put on. And you can see that that was just a sprinkle. And where to now, Mr. Reese? Just blowing it out. Just blowing it out. No more decorative elements no, on this one. So. Okay. So you saw him pick up the color, coat the color with a small amount of uh, baking soda, and then an immediate gather over the baking soda, and that caused the bubbles to appear. You probably see them a little bit better up close to the pipe or iron right now because that's getting a little bit cooler. And once again, he'll trap compressed air with his finger. It has no place to go but out into the hot glass. It blows it out and increases the diameter there. The metal blades are called jacks. They're used to cut a line right here adjacent to the end of the flow pipe. And what that'll do is give him a place to break it free. He needs a jack line in order to get this to separate from the blow pipe. He could do it without a jack line, but it would shatter the glass. That joint, when he breaks it, will release a lot of tension. And this shape that contains the curved shoulder and the constricted neck is ideal for releasing that tension. And when that tension's released, it keeps it from breaking apart. A quick check of the calipers, make sure he's got a diameter that will fit the piece of wood over there. And again, Foster prepares the punty, which, if I'm correct, comes from French for pantal, which could be bridge, but I don't speak French. All right, he's attaching the bunty. He'll get it centered, aligned with the central axis of the piece. 
then he'll chill the neck make it a little bit weaker than it already is you can see the glow in the putty it's hot it's strong it's soft it's hard weak up there the weak spot breaks and Foster runs it over to the glory hole again cold enough to fracture going to take a little while to reheat and again we'll open this up into a cup like shape and then heat the living daylights out of the bottom of it so it can be pressed onto the wood so it's a lot of fun and it's a really neat technique which I assure you even though we didn't get started on time we will be out of here in six minutes <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't understand the part about, is it the point or, oh, the P-O-I-N-T-E, point. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure, Gerard, I don't know. Okay, so now he's got the end of the vessel heated up. You can see that very small opening again where it broke free of the blowing iron. He'll begin to open that with the jack blades. And you'll notice somebody asked a question about a shield earlier. There's not really enough heat generated by this to bother Josh. I don't know if that's because he burned out all the sensory nerves in his forearm years ago, or it's just not hot. I'm kidding. That's not the case at all. But the, the more you work around the hot glass, the more you get accustomed to it. Can you mix two plus colors of frit to make a new color? Yes, absolutely, yes. Oh, okay, Ger Gerard must have been asking about Pontel or the punty we talked about. The jacks he's using now are constructed of wood, they're called Parchofi. They steal less heat from the glass, they don't put as many marks in the glass, and you can see by the diameter of the blade, it gives you a little bit better opening there, a little easier to do. I checked with the calipers to see if he's in their ballpark measure the wood for the placement of the cup now a little bit of water onto the punty or pontal joint and you can see the bubbles beautifully formed in there he'll drop that onto the marver and foster will again heat it up The entire bottom is softened. Josh inverts it, presses down hard on the glass to get it to conform to the shape of the wood. He'll actually probably flex the sides of the vessel a little bit too. He can actually bend it out. You saw him use his index finger there and that will now conforms to the shape of the wood. Once that settles down, he'll take it and put it in the annealer. There's your impression how it fits into the wooden socket. And away he goes. Uh, we do not have our own, well, we have pretty much our blowing irons. Uh, we do sanitize them, especially with uh, COVID and everything. But uh, Foster has a set of irons he uses. Josh is cooling the piece of wood in a bucket of water now, and it's good to go. And Josh has some particular irons that he uses, but uh, every shop has their own rules. Many people do own their own blowing irons, but we take extra precautions to keep things sanitary here. Thank you, Josh. Thank Marvelous you, job. Okay, thank wonderful. Thank you, and Josh. thank you, Foster. And, thank and I'm you, not going to run down and show you Theta. She's on the other end of the studio with the computer, but I see our time is running short. Please join us again, if you like, on uh, YouTube on Tuesday mornings at 1030. That's Eastern uh, Daylight Time right now. 
Uh, we won't be going back to standard time till next fall. And immediately after that half hour broadcast from 10.30 to 11, we switch over to YouTube Live and do a two hour broadcast. So if you'd like to learn more about glass blowing or see more of it or answer any of your questions, we'd be glad to help out. Get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. And thanks for taking us around the world from the art of fire. Have a good day.